What does Easter mean to you? How would you answer this question? Would you say, it is your time to hunt for eggs? Perhaps it's to eat your kids' candies? Or stuff your face with chocolate bunnies? What does Easter mean to you? Do you think of the cross, the nails, the thorn, the tomb? Do you think of what Jesus Christ did for you? What does Easter mean to you? Easter is a very special time for us. Here are some of your answers. Easter is a time that we can go to church and just worship all together and know that God didn't just come here to be a normal person and to live a normal life, but he came here to die on the cross. And that's what Easter means to me. About love and kindness. Easter, of course, is about the death and burial and resurrection of Christ. And I think that's one of the most important well, Easter is one of the most important holidays for us Christians is because of that. And uh, um, I thank God for his salvation and what he did on the cross. About when the tomb was empty. Easter is a time for us to celebrate and remember the resurrection of Jesus Christ and the sacrifice he made for us. As it says in John 3.16, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish. We remember that and hold true to that. We understand the true spirit of Easter. I've learned over the past year that Easter is so much more than just Easter egg hunting, the chocolates and the marshmallows you find in the groceries. It is about Jesus dying on the cross for me and rising again and living. Um, this year, Easter marks a year that we've been going to Ohana Baptist and we've been service understanding and coming to the Lord. I mean, all of that means a lot to me because as my testimony earlier said, I was a Christian and been to church, but not faithfully and it didn't recollect with me. Now coming to Ohana Baptist, I understand and know more a lot, a lot more about Jesus than I did before. For me, it is the rebirth of our Lord and a reminder of what he did for us that he demonstrated himself as Lord defeating death and also with his death, the salvation for us through his grace. To me, Easter means getting together and celebrating Jesus' resurrection. Easter makes me happy because what it means to me is that Jesus died on the cross for our sins so that we didn't have to die on, on a cross because of our sins and that he rose from the grave on the day that we call Easter and that while you're still living, you still have a chance to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ as your savior you're, so you can go to heaven. For me, I see it as eternal love from him because for him to die on the cross to save to save us from our wrongdoing, it means a lot and it shows how much our Christ loves us, that he will die for us no matter what happens. Easter is the best day of the year. It's when we recognize that Christ died for our sins and rose again. So hallelujah, Christ is risen. And because of that, we can live in the freedom from sin and have eternal hope in him. Easter for me means uh, God giving us hope in our lives. Growing up in the Philippines, I never really had an idea of what Easter was like until I celebrated my first Easter Sunday last year. Easter for me is a reminder of God's love for us, His children, that He sent His only begotten Son to die on the cross to save us from our sins. It also reminds me of God's power that not even the grave could hold Him. His resurrection shows how powerful our God is, that He overcame death and sin, and this just gives me more reason to trust Him with my life. It is 
Jesus died, they killed him. Did he stay dead? No. This Easter, ponder on this question. What does Easter mean to you? What does Easter mean to you? That's what we're going to talk about today. You can turn your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and while you're turned over there, we're going to dismiss the children for their classes. Again, you can go to ohana.church forward slash live, and there are links to classes for both the younger children and the older children. And so we're going to give you a couple minutes there to go ahead and link up with that, and then turn to 1 Corinthians 15, and we'll be all set to go. If you'll turn your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 12 through 19. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, we're going to begin with verse number 12, down through verse number 19. The notes, by the way, copies of the notes are available at ohana.church forward slash live. We have the notes in English and five other languages as well, if you'd like to download those. Now, if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there be no resurrection of the dead then is Christ not risen? And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain, and your faith is also vain. Yea, and we are found false witnesses of God, because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he raised not up. If so, be the dead rise not. For if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain. You are yet in your sins. Then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ... We are of all men most miserable. Let's bow for prayer. Father, we pray as we open up your word today that we might see Christ, that we might see that open tomb and the power of God's resurrection. We need that power today especially. We pray that you would give us the hope of the resurrection. For it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Earlier on, uh, I think a few days back, they were having a briefing at the White House and one reporter asked the president, does this mean there's no Easter this year? When the president, I don't remember exactly what he answered, but I can tell you that even though we're not meeting together in the church, we still have Easter. First Corinthians chapter 15, verses 12 through 14 says, now if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you there's no resurrection of the dead? But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen? 
And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain, and your faith also is vain. Now, I know there's a lot of confusion about what to do for Easter, and we've come up with the online services. But Easter was already a confusing holiday. You know, Christmas is on December 25th. Independence Day is on July 4th. Valentine's Day, February 14th. Even Thanksgiving, that's not on the same day every year, is always on the fourth Thursday of the month. But Easter, Easter can come any time between March 22nd to April 25th. The official definition is this. The first Sunday after the first moon, full moon, occurring after the vernal equinox. Now that's when the earth is 90 degree angle from the sun. Now, I don't know about you, but it sounds like you have to be a mathematician and an astronomer to figure out when Easter is, or you can do like I do and just look it up on Google. You see, there may be confusion about the day that we celebrate Easter, but there should be no confusion about the resurrection. In Acts chapter 17 and verse 18, it says, Then certain philosophers of the Epicureans and of the Stoics encountered him, Paul. And some said, What will this babbler say? Others, some, he seemeth to be a setter forth of strange gods because he preached unto them Jesus and the resurrection. See, they were confused. They didn't understand this, this resurrection. What is it all about? You know, there are people who attend church every Easter to worship the unknown God. In Acts chapter 17, verses 22 and 23, it says, Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, Ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all these things, you are too superstitious. Now you remember from your junior high hist world history that Mars Hill was where they had all the, the temples to the various Greek gods built. And here he was with all those temples. He says, I perceive that in all things, you are too superstitious. You're, you're too religious. For as I passed by and beheld your devotions, I found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God whom therefore you ignorantly worship him, declare I unto you. You see, there's a lot of people that are celebrating Easter Day, but they're celebrating an unknown God. They don't know Jesus. They don't understand the resurrection. They don't even necessarily believe in the resurrection. But without the resurrection, there is no Easter. There is no celebration. You see, you can know him. In Philippians chapter 3 and verses 9 and 10, Paul says, And be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is of the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know him, and the power of his resurrection, and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. That word power is where we get our word dynamite. The resurrection, it, it, it brings great power because it's the power of God over sin and over death. It's the power to give us salvation. But you need that hope in you. In 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 15, it says, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asks you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. You see, we need to have the hope inside of us so that we can share that hope with others around us as well. It's the hope of the resurrection. It's the hope of eternal life. See, every day, not just Easter, or not even just Sundays, is resurrection day for the Christian. Luke 9, 23 says, he said to them all, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Every day we need to die to ourselves and we need to be raised again in the power of Jesus Christ. We need to have, make every day a day to celebrate the resurrection of Christ. Rise up every day praising God for your salvation and for Jesus. In Psalms 118 verse 21, it says, I will praise thee for thou hast heard me and art become my salvation. In verse 24, it says, this is the day which the Lord hath made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. You see, every day is a resurrection Sunday. Every day is a day to rejoice in our salvation, to rejoice in a risen Savior, to rejoice in the message of Easter and the power of the resurrection. Some people are confused about, is that they're, they're confused about the whole idea of Jesus and that the resurrection is just a one or two times a year occurrence. It's just a Christmas and Easter we celebrate Jesus. 
Jesus is 24-7, 365 days a year. Hebrews 4.12 says, but exhort one another daily while it's called today. Lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Hebrews 10.25 says, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. We've been put onto a self-quarantine type situation. We've been asked to stay in our house and not go out and interact with other people. And a lot of people are complaining and not liking being uh, uh, separated and having to be by themselves. But you know what's interesting? Is there are some Christians that have been practicing a self-imposed quarantine from church long before the coronavirus. Instead of going and assembling with other believers every Sunday and every opportunity they had, they practice self-imposed quarantine at home. You see, I'm looking forward to when this is all over and we can get back together. I'm looking forward to when we can celebrate as a body of Christ the power of the resurrection. And it's unfortunate that this whole coronavirus thing happened right around Easter. But every Sunday is a celebration Sunday. I want you to look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse number 19. It says, in this life, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. Let me ask you a question. Do you hope or do you have hope? You say, what do you mean, Pastor? What's the difference? Do you hope or do you have hope? Now, here's the difference. I hope they will be able to find a vaccine. But when they find a vaccine, the headline is going to be, there is hope they found a vaccine. Do you see the difference? We can hope they're going to find a vaccine someday. But when they have the vaccine, now there's hope. You see, we can have, first of all, hope in our salvation. In Titus chapter 1 and verse number 2, it says, In hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. You know, the world was not prepared for this virus. Uh, they didn't have test kits. They didn't have enough PPE. They didn't have uh, a, vi a vaccine or a cure or anything for it. They were not prepared for this virus. But God has been prepared for this disease of sin since day one. He already had the cure before you were ever born. The Bible says in Romans 3, 23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We're all sinners. And God knew we'd be born with this disease called sin, but he prepared a cure long before we were ever born. And that cure is Jesus Christ. What you and I need is we need his immunity. It, it seems there's some people that are immune to the coronavirus. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 21 says, For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. You see, it's Jesus who knew no sin. He's immune from this disease of sin. He had no sin. And we need his immunity in our lives. If you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 5, it says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also you received, and wherein you stand, by which also you are saved, if you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how first uh, I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he's buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. And then it goes on from there. You see, the, the gospel means good news. When they find the cure for the coronavirus, it's going to be headline. It's going to be on all the news stations. It's going to be in big, bold letters on the newspaper. It's going to be good news. We found the cure. And folks, we've already got the good news of the cure for sin. It's Jesus Christ. It's his blood. In Matthew chapter 26 and verse number 28, it says, For this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. You know, they use 
pig's blood and rat's blood to make cures that you and I take. And we're okay with that. But there's people who have the problem with the blood of Christ, which was shed to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. His blood, his sacrifice, when he died on the cross, that blood was shed to save me and to save you from our sins. You'll take blood, you'll take medicine that's made from pig's blood, but you won't take the blood of Christ and receive his cure in your life. You know, if they came to you with this great big long needle and they said, listen, in order to be cured from coronavirus, you've got to take this shot. You know what you would do? You would bend over and you would uh, uh, take the shot. You would just right away, no problem at all, I'm going to take that shot. But you know what? You need to receive Jesus Christ. Titus chapter 3, verses 5 through 7 says, Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us, by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost, which he said in us abundantly through, our, through Jesus Christ our Savior, that being justified by his grace, we should be made heirs according uh, to the hope of eternal life. See, there it is again, the hope of eternal life. It's not, I hope I'm going to heaven. Like, I hope they'll find a cure. It's, there's hope because they find a cure. And there's hope because I have Jesus Christ as my Savior. And he is the cure for our sin. He is the one that can give us eternal life. But you've got to receive that cure. In Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10, it says that thou, shalt, that thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God has raised from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. In Romans 10, 13, it says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. To be saved, you've got to accept God's free gift of salvation. On Thursday, we gave away, uh, I think, close to 700 pizzas. We gave 160 of them to three hospitals and a health center. And we also gave, uh, uh, gave out pizzas right here in front of the church. You could sign up and drive by and pick up a pizza. And about 6 o'clock, when we were all finished, we still had some pizzas left. And, and, and so we didn't, want, we didn't know what to do. So we said, we're just giving away whoever drives by. And so our, our people were out there. And in fact, if you know Pastor Andy, he was out there in the middle of the road. He was out there with a box of pizza and cars would drive by. And he was going, stop! And stopping the cars. And he said, here's a free pizza. And, and most of the people were kind of shocked. And uh, they looked at him like he was crazy. But when he told them it's a free pizza, they, they took it. Although I remember this one car came by and he didn't want it. I, I mean, he gave us a dirty look. He, he drove around Pastor Andy, and he went on down the road, and he didn't want anything to do with the free pizza. It was his to receive, but he left it there. And salvation is a free gift of God, but you have to receive it. You have to trust him as your Savior. You have to call upon his name and ask him to be your Savior. What I'm thankful for is there's enough of Jesus for everybody. 1 John chapter 2 and verse number 2, it says, And he is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. We've got a limited supply of test kits. There's a limited supply of the medicine that they think that might work to cure coronavirus. When they have the vaccine, there won't be enough for everybody, at least right away. But there's enough of Jesus Christ for the whole world, and that includes you but you've got to receive him. If you don't take the medicine, you're not cured. Either you have it or you don't. In 1 John chapter 5, verses 12 and 13, it says, He that hath the Son hath life. He that hath not the Son of God hath not life. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. You see, Sometimes I have some pills I'm supposed to take and sometimes my wife will say, did you take your pill? And I say, I can't remember. You might forget taking your pill, but you don't forget trusting Jesus. 
You don't forget asking him to be your savior and to give you eternal life. You see, you and I have a disease called sin. All have sinned. That's every one of us. You may not be as bad as the person next to you. There can be people, people have coronavirus, don't even know it. They're not showing symptoms, but they still have it. And you have this disease called sin. And maybe you haven't robbed a bank or murdered somebody, but you've lied. You've had bad thoughts. You've disobeyed your parents. You've said mean things. All have sinned. That's the disease. And even though everybody does not die from coronavirus, everybody's going to die from that disease called sin. Hebrews 9, 27. It's appointed on men once to die, but after this, the judgment. Now, are you ready for that day when you die? Have you trusted Jesus Christ? Do you have the hope of eternal life? Not, I hope I'll go to heaven if I'm good enough. Because Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says, For by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourselves is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. It's not, I hope I go to heaven because I'm good enough. It's that I have hope because God has provided the cure through Jesus Christ, and I have accepted him as my Savior, and I have the hope of eternal life. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse number 3 says, Remembering without ceasing your work of faith, and labor of love, and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of God and our Father. There's three things we need right now. We need faith, we need love, and we need hope. Faith is the foundation of hope. Hebrews 11, 1 says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Verse 6 says, But without faith it is impossible to please him, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is and as a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. You see, our faith in God, our faith in his word, our faith gives us hope for the future. There's a patience in hope. Romans 8, 25 says, but if we hope for that we see not, then do we with patience wait for it. You see, hope has to have patience because it doesn't ha always happen right away. We've got to be, able, be willing to wait on the Lord in hope. And there's a labor of love. In Romans chapter 5, and verse number 5, it says, And hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given us. For those of you that are Christians, this is a time that God has given you an opportunity to show people there is hope. And you can show it through the love of God as you shed it abroad in your neighborhood with the people that you're in contact with. Let's show our hope by showing the love of God to others in very practical ways. Now, 1 Corinthians 13, 13 says this, And now abideth faith, hope, charity, which is another word for love, these three, but the greatest of these is charity. When we get to heaven, we don't need faith anymore because we're going to see Jesus. When we get to heaven, we don't need hope anymore because our hope is fulfilled. When we get to heaven, we're still going to have love. And so let's make that love the foundation of our lives because that's what's going to stay with us for eternity. There's an interesting verse in Proverbs 13, 12. It says this, Hope deferred maketh the heart sick. But when the desire cometh, it is a tree of life. Hope deferred. The word deferred means to put off. Sometimes hope is something that we're saying, I, I have this hope, but it's, it's not going to happen till later. It's, it's in the future. I, I hope this virus, will, they'll find a cure. I hope this uh, quarantine and lockdown will, will end. I hope that I'll get my job back. Psalms 43, verse 5 says, Why art thou cast down, O my soul? And why art thou disquieted within me? Hope in God. For I shall yet praise him, who is the health of my countenance and my God. My hope is not in the medical community, although the job they're doing is absolutely amazing. My hope is not in our government. And I know there's been a lot of complaints about our government, but I think they're dealing with a, a brand new situation that nobody expected. And sure, maybe they should have been better prepared or maybe they should have been a little faster, but I understand. 
uh, we're having to deal with a new situation. And we're playing catch up all the time. My hope's not in the government. My hope is in God. And the Bible says, for I shall yet praise him who is the help of my countenance and my God. Your hope shows in your countenance. You walk around all day with a sour look on your face and a bad attitude, you've got no hope. Because hope, the root word for both patience and hope in the Bible is the word cheerful. Hope is not sad. Hope is is where we find our joy. And as I mentioned in another sermon, it's, it's one of those circular things. As I found that when there's no hope, I feel sad. So I need to put a smile on my face, and when I put the smile on my face, then I feel better. Don't wait for the feeling to do the actions of hope. Let's let our countenance show that we have hope. Hope in God and hope in Jesus Christ. But the verse in Psalms 43, 5 says, Why art thou cast down, O my soul, and why art thou disquieted within me? The word disquieted means murmur, complain, and gripe. We're doing a lot of that right now. If what I see on Facebook is any guideline. A lot of people are complaining and murmuring and griping about what's going on right now. And I understand that's human nature. But that doesn't help anything. If you're going to have hope and patience, then stop complaining. Because complaining does not change anything. It just makes it worse for you and everybody around you. Hope is full of joy and peace. Romans 15, 13. Now the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Ghost. God wants us to have joy. God wants us to have peace during this difficult time. In Philippians 1, verse 20, it says, According to my earnest expectation and my hope, that in nothing I shall be shamed, but that with all boldness is always so, now also Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether it be by life or by death. Now Paul, when he wrote that, was a prisoner. And yet he said, I still have hope. Not only do I have hope, I have expectations. I'm looking to the future. Now, I don't know what the future holds. I don't know who's going to get their job back and who's not. I don't know how the economy is going to turn out. I don't know if they're going to find a cure. I don't know what the future holds, but I do know who holds the future, future, and that's God. And so I expect great things from God, and I'm expecting that God's got something he wants to do in my life. Now, Paul never got out of prison, but I still believe his expectations were fulfilled. Because he didn't look to freedom to give him the expectation, he looked to God. As I studied for this message, in just a couple verses we'll close, I found an interesting verse, and I had to really meditate on this verse. In Zechariah 9, 12, it says, Turn you to the stronghold, ye prisoners of hope. Even today do I declare that I will render double unto thee. They were prisoners of hope. Now, if you read the context of the passage, he was talking to people who had been prisoners and and now they're actually free. But even though they left their bars behind of the prison, even though they left the chains behind, they still were prisoners of hope. Years ago, my wife and I were first married. We got a dog and, and this dog was an outside dog. So I built him a dog house and he never went in the doghouse. He'd always sleep on the roof of the doghouse, kind of like Snoopy does. And we had him on a, on a chain connected to the doghouse. And he, he only used the extreme end of the chain. Whenever he's outside, he'd take that chain. He would stretch it to the limit to where he's choking himself. And he would stay there at that point. And I'd kind of push him back and say, just, you got all this room. We gave him a long chain. He had plenty of room, but he'd always come out to the very edge of the chain. And one day I was out there and I was petting him. He was on the chain. I was petting him. And I reached over my hand. And I unhooked the chain, and, but he didn't notice it apparently. And as I finished petting him, I walked away. And as I walked away, he would start barking and jumping up and down like he always did when he's on the other chain. 
but he was right there exactly as far as the chain would go. He was free from the chain, but he was still a prisoner. And I believe that there are a lot of us that are prisoners of hope. What this is, is we're doing nothing while we hope things will get better. Prisoners of hope just sit around and hope things will change and do nothing to change anything. You need to do some things change. Maybe you can't go to work now, but you know what you can do? You can do some work around the house. You can spend more time with your family. You can work on having a better marriage. You see, there's a lot of things that we can do as prisoners in our home. So don't be a prisoner of hope. Don't be a prisoner saying, well, I hope it gets better. When it gets better, everything. No, don't look to when it gets better. Make it better now. Paul said in Philippians 1, 19 and 20, for I know that this shall turn to my salvation through your prayers and the supply of, spirit, uh, of the spirit of Jesus Christ according to my earnest expectations, my hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but that with all boldness is always so now also Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether it be by life or death. Paul's freedom, his salvation from prison didn't come on this earth, but it did come in heaven. He had hope, and he was not a prisoner of hope. Psalm 71, verse 14 says, but I will hope continually and will yet praise thee more and more. May God give you hope today, but hope starts with salvation, with Jesus Christ, knowing that you're going to heaven, knowing that your sins are forgiven, knowing that you have eternal life, and the Bible says you can know that. Do you have the hope of salvation? If not, you can trust him today.